Today's guest is Anne Feutstel. Her organization is called Writing Wisely. She talks about educating people about mental health and how we can use the power of watching movies to help us cope with life and live more fulfilled lives. We are providing a space for people who might be struggling to put themselves out there. We talk about her mental health journey and how she discovered watching movies was a key part of her self-care and a form of therapy. Give a warm welcome to Ever Blessed, Anne Foistel. Well, hello. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Thanks for having me on. Yes, ma'am. I guess coming from a... um, unknowledged perspective as well as like wow I didn't even know this wasn't even a thing that had a name for it I would love for you to kind of give me a cliff note exactly what cinema therapy and your background can you kind of give a someone who doesn't know anything about it a little bit of what it is sure um so cinema therapy is uh basically where you use movies as a form of therapy. So there's different ways to go about it. Um, You can do it on your own, you can do it with a therapist, or you can do it with a group. But what you do is, first of all, you let yourself be immersed in the movie. You don't have any distractions. Uh, You're not on your phone or you know, anything like that while you're watching the movie, folding laundry, whatever, you're just watching the movie. Um, And that way you get the most out of the experience. Um, After you finish watching the movie, uh, you you journal about it, you write down sort of your thoughts and feelings as soon as you can after watching the movie. And then um, you sort of reflect on, on what you wrote and reflect on the movie and you know, either talk about that with somebody else or or just sort of think about perhaps there's a theme in the movie that relates to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk in the book, I focus on 12 movies in the book and um, for each movie, I reflect on how they affect my mental health and I reflect on the themes of the movie. So for instance, you know, my sister and I, you know, like any siblings, it's not always the perfect relationship, but I want it to be, you know, close and familial. So when I, I can watch a movie that has sisters in it and sort of think, well, how does this compare to my relationship with my sister? How could I, you know, maybe either not do what they're doing in the movie or do do what they're doing in the movie mm-hmm. to have my relationship with my sister be stronger this is so much information that I'm like <laughs> it never really dawned on me and I just feel like I've been under a rock for so long that I don't socialize I don't interact I'm, I'm it's very hard for me to start conversations you know um being an introvert it's like people want us to have these little little conversations and I'm like can you we can I just go back into my corner where I belong <laughs> just for a little bit you know <laughs> so to hear people like talk about things that are automatically in my mind like I've been so enthralled in movies like that's like part of my life and I just took it for granted correlating it to specifically a therapeutic type of sense so I apologize carry on carry on sorry no 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 I know I and I completely relate to what you're talking about you know I'm definitely an introvert and the loneliness and the isolation has definitely thrown me for a loop Mm -hmm. um and yeah definitely movies and and various tv shows have helped me through the last couple years as I've helped so many other people mostly the movies that I've seen previously and then I watch again as opposed to I mean there's been some great movies that have come out but it's it's not quite the same thing as those comfort movies as I call them. Right. Um, thinking of nostalgia during my childhood, like uh I'm a 70s baby, so I am thankful that I was able to have those types of movies that have brought out a lot of emotion. How kind of it was like almost like a building block of understanding human behavior, human emotion, um, human nature on how people interact with one another. Um, how not to interact with one another. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, like it just, it just never dawned on me that that's something that, and I completely agree, but we've had an emotional 
lockdown. We've had, and it's it's even more excruciating when you're already in a lockdown that you've been you placed yourself in it because of circumstances of handling things in life. Um, and I just never really, I think I've actually increased, like I've just been binging all these movies. It's just for some reason, movies from the 70s and 80s and and older. It takes like maybe five or 10 movies of today's world be in comparison to one movie that I used to see when I was a child. It doesn't have the mm-hmm. same effect. You, you're trying to find that. And uh, yeah, that's just interesting how the perspective that you have. It's called Our Favorite Movies, How Films Affect Our Mental Health. Okay, yeah. Um, I want to ask you more about that, but I also like to have the listeners know who am I talking to? <laughs> and I forgot to, <laughs> to, to automatically introduce you. Um, and can you tell me what inspired you to venture into this career path? Like, I mean, did you start off to have the correlation between your uh, mental health and um, watching movies or how did this come about? Can you tell me how this all started sure. for you? Actually, before I answer that question, I just wanted yes. to go back to what you were saying about being a child yes. and, and watching those movies because yeah. um, the 12 movies I focus on in the book, 10 of them were movies that I watched growing up and as a teenager okay. and ones that I watched with my sister. So um, just wanted to say, I understand completely, completely what you're saying. And I just find myself going back to movies from that era or, you know, in my early twenties kind of thing, just seems like the movie of the last 15 years or so, I'm just not as into, mm-hmm. I mean, I'll watch them and I've definitely watched quite a few movies. I, I, you know, I try to keep up with movies, or at least I did. Like now, it's just like almost impossible to keep up with movies. <laughs> so much. <laughs> so, but no, um, they're just so soothing, and and you know, for me, I was born in 1980, so um, it was really the 80s and 90s movies that were really the ones that that were nearest and dearest to the heart for me. Mm-hmm. And of the of the the ten movies that you're identifying, um, did you want? Are you would you be able to discuss a little a bit of them as we carry on the conversation, or did you sure. want to hit on the subjects now? Um, it's up your preference. Because I mean, if we're on the roll, like I said, I told you, I'm glad you pulled me off the Everest because I was going to go somewhere, <laughs> and y'all are not going to take I me mean, back. <laughs> we can still go there. I just wanted to make sure I didn't lose that important part of the conversation. Yes. yes thank you. Thank you. See, you're my lifesaver. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. But All it's right. true. I mean, it's just so many people, you know, think about what your favorite movies are. Think about what you watched growing up. I guarantee if you go back to the movies you watched growing up, you're going to have a better mood. Mm-hmm. Rewatch them. You're going to feel really good. I, I pretty much guarantee it. Yeah. I think from one of your, I think from multiple of, of the engaged speaking engagements you've had, like I always like my go-to movie. And I think, you know, probably know right off the, off the top of my head, you know, Princess Bride, like yes. nobody can understand the gravity of this movie. It's just like, it's to me, it's riveting. It's, it's, it's on a whole nother level. And these kids nowadays are like, roll their eyes. Like, that's just so, you know, that's so eighties, you know, or whatever the case may be, but like, that is nostalgia for me. And luckily my son, the good thing is he has an old soul and he actually loves the black and whites and he loves the old musicals and he gets involved in all of that. So I was able to have that moment, like you said, with your sister, you know, taking a movie and just kind of, having that familiar memory of something that I was, you know, a child and I'm kind of carry on the tradition of torturing my children, you know? So this is, <laughs> he actually loved it. So I'm just saying like, there's other things that they, they just don't want to watch. And, oh my gosh, so many memories. So, so, and I think you even mentioned that it just kind of brings you into a, a calmer and it levels you based on the type of uh, the mental odometer, I guess you could say, or the, mm-hmm. the situations you're in. So um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Enough of that. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, yes, so what inspired you to venture into this career path? And I know that you are an author. Um, can you tell us anything else? Like, how did this all start with you? Where did this all begin? Sure. So I think it like technically began when I was seven and I wrote a play about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Oh, <laughs> starring Daniel the T Striped Tiger. Yes. So, <laughs> and I've been writing ever since then. Um, so yeah, I've always loved to write my, ever since I was little, I, well, ever since I was like 10 years old, um, my goal has been to publish a book. Mm -hmm. I just always wanted to do that. And then what happened was I was working on a crisis and support line and I got burnt out mm -hmm. and I decided I wanted to just still do something with mental health, but it didn't want it to be like frontline stressful work. You know, I wanted, I wanted to do something that was more comfortable and less stressful. So I thought to myself, well, I could write about mental health. And then I thought, well, why don't I write about mental health and movies? Because those are two of my favorite things. And I had sort of read over the years about the connection between movies and mental health. And mm -hmm. I had read this book called the movie uh, motion picture prescription i think it's uh, I'm, I'm not remembering the, off the top of my head the name of the book but that's where i got introduced to cinema therapy and it was just um yeah i just i just realized hey there's this whole thing out here about the research behind how movies and mental health combine so that's how I decided to write the book. And also to sort of the slant I got on it was I was sort of talking about it with various people and they said, well, you don't wanna go purely research. You don't wanna go just to give the facts. You wanna have a personal spin on it. So that's what I decided to do was to go the personal spin. And I think it came out a lot better than if it was a purely like research dry and yeah, not quite academic but slightly academic book. It's, I, I definitely have, you know, sections where I talk about research, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a very personal book. And mm -hmm. I talk about having bipolar disorder and generalized anxiety disorder in the book. Yeah. One of the things that I have viewed from your previous interviews um, as a guest on other engagements that, you had mentioned that you have um, struggled with that and the bipolar disorder. I, it's always a sensitive subject for me. That's why I get really quiet because I get emotional about it. <laughs> I know that we have dealt with fluctuations of our moods and some people have extreme and some people um, have dealt with it long-term, short-term. You know, I myself have dealt with a lot of that. Um, you know, I'm um, being a mother of three boys. I've dealt with post-traumatic or postpartum um, from post-traumatic because of previous childhood trauma, mm -hmm. as well as relationship trauma. Um, you know, postpartum, I was already depressed enough going through as a young teen mom with my first child. So and, you know, other things. And I've never been diagnosed with anything. Mm -hmm. um, but have you gone through the motions of how did you find out that you had? Is it a permanent thing? Is it a, sh is it a short term thing? And how did you become diagnosed with? Uh, is it bipolar disorder? And mm -hmm. generalized anxiety disorder? Generalized. Basically, I've been dealing with depression since I was 10. So and dealing with suicide ideation, you know, thoughts of suicide since I was 10. So definitely that part of it is, is very long-term. Yeah. Everything that I have is, is long-term. I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder and generalized anxiety disorder in my early twenties. Okay. So I'm in my forties now. So it's yeah. Lifelong kind of thing. And, you know, I, I do therapy, I take medication you know, I, I do self-care, that kind of thing. And movies are such a huge part of that for me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
it all, I guess it all depends on the moment that you are needing a particular type of genre that gives you the proper effect that you're looking for. So like if it's a comedy or a romantic or action, you know, what's, what is your go-to um, movies, depending on the type of mood that you're, you're looking for at that moment? Sure. My go-to is pretty much most of the time, and I, I talk about this in the book, is dramedies, the comedy slash drama. Okay. Um, just because I like to laugh and I like to think and I like to feel, you know, and I, I tend to go towards also movies that make me think, you know, that have the layers, that have something sort of extra. So like them. the psychological movies that they have, I believe? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, I'm not discounting sort of the pure comedy, the romantic comedies, that kind of thing, which I do enjoy. But I think if I was to pick, you know, a, a, a certain type of movie, that would be the movie I pick. So, you know, for instance, a lot of, and it's not necessarily have to have, you know, an adult themes. I mean, my favorite movie and the one that I would count as as a dramedy and and as one that makes you think is Inside Out, okay, the Pixar movie. So I think any movie I saw, um, the Mitchells versus the Machines, which I thought was a really interesting dramedy that was on Netflix, an animated movie. So it can really be, you know, for a family movie. You know, people call them for kids, which I think is not really quite accurate because just because mm -hmm. it's animated doesn't mean it's just for kids oh for sure there's times that I because <laughs> I mean I have a 10 year old right now and I'm like do you want to watch this with me and he's like eh, I'm not interested I'm like okay fine I'm just I'll do it <laughs> you know I feel like I'm Goldilocks well if you don't want this movie well then I'll I'll have it for myself or something like that so <laughs> <laughs> you're never too you're never too old to have an animated uh, collection of interest. I mean, I get it that yeah. their whole goal is their consumer is narrowing specifically on the demand that it's for children, but it's, it should not be a label on animation. It's, you know, they're specifically just before children. So, I mean, there's actually a lot of animation out there that is specifically for adults. So true. Yikes. Very true. You got to be very careful, you know, like yeah. what rated, what, what is it rated? And my son's like, this is rated this. I'm like, if this is rated, like unrated, that's, we, we, we might have to, I might have to look at it first before you look yeah. at it, you know. Well, but there's yeah. a TV show that I absolutely love, but should no child should ever watch it, I think, which is uh, Bojack Horseman. Sure. That one is, it's, it's about this actor who's, so it's in this world where, some people are just regular people and some people ha are like animal people. So they have like a, a, a human's body and like a horse's head. Okay. I think I remember seeing that as a, like the trailer of it. It's yeah. really interesting. So, you know, and looking at dysfunctional families and it's just, it's just really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's um, looking at, you know, adoption and all kinds of different subjects it's just but it, I mean it can be both profoundly sad and very entertaining at the same time so anyway that's, I might have to put that on now I'm going list. off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> wait hold on hold on let me <laughs> let me get let me get the rope <laughs> yeah thank you for sharing that because I if you didn't tell me to come back I would have been completely off the screen <laughs> literally <laughs> off the screen it's like I'm gone. Um, I guess in circles don't really have um, people talking about that and the correlation, unless you know my circle is very very small. Like, you know, I'm party of one. So it's um, it's really interesting to hear this. It's, it's intriguing to me. Just kind of doing a little bit, like you said, don't do the research. Uh, me personally, <laughs> I like to do research, but I also kind of like. Like I said, you hey, you have to have some personal background and understanding some things, and I and I love to, uh, I love that you have a book specifically on um, your personal experience with it because that draws people in to understand that you're not the only one, and they're not the only one that has the same type of 
uh, ideation that there is some link between cinema and therapy in, in our mental health. So, so, and I guess one of the questions is what is the biggest myth that you see um, shared as advice over and over again that you'd like to debunk specifically on the subject of mental health? Because I know that's one of the sensitive subjects that a lot, that a lot of people don't like to talk about. You know, this is something that hits home for a lot of people who are struggling with it, but they don't understand that they might have been fed information that was incorrect. So I'll talk about, I'll tie it into movies or at least actors. Okay. Is a lot of people think, well, if you just change your diet and exercise, you'd just be so much better. Mm. And yes, those can affect mental health, both of them. But the most fit person who's eating, you know, great, who's exercising, they still are going to have some mental health stuff. You know, I, uh, back in the mid 2000s was when Tom Cruise just sort of like decided that he was gonna, you know, in the press, just verbally beat up Brooke Shields because she was talking about having postpartum depression. And he was, you know, just beating her up about it. And the fact that she was going through therapy, and I think maybe was taking some medication, I forget exactly, but he was just you know, oh, well, then, you know, all you need to do is diet and exercise and you'll just be fine. Mm. So that to this day, you know, people say that all the time, not to me so much. I mean, it's sort of what I see in the press and and stuff, but I've, if anybody tries to say that to me, I quickly shut them down Yeah, because it's just, you know, it's not helpful. And even to somebody who doesn't diet and exercise as much as they should, which is definitely me, Saying that to me is not helpful. It's it's very judgmental, I think. Mm-hmm. Another one is, you know, oh, you just need to smile more. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's probably the reason why I do it a lot all the time, because that was one of the things people would say. You should smile more. You, you, it, it turns your whole day better if you just smile. And I'm like... I am smiling. Can't you see through the tears that I'm smiling? Yeah, everything's great. You know, no, it's, it's, I understand, you know, but yeah. It's just yeah, years ago, I had a therapist tell me that I should smile more. And I'm like, seriously? Wow. Wow. That's not helpful at all. Even a therapist. Oh, for the yeah. Love. Yeah. <laughs> Revoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't last too long for me. Oh, well, I hope he didn't last. I mean, he could, that's completely damaging for someone who's coming through his office looking for, you know, some type of advice and comfort and processing. That's extremely damaging. So yeah, Yeah. my gosh. Um, But yeah, thank you for sharing that because uh, there's a lot of things that uh, I have noticed that nobody wants to talk about. Um, And I'm glad that we're able to share that because in some cultures, like me specifically, you know, I like to throw the culture card. Unfortunately, that's me. I'm BIPOC. Woohoo. Um, but it is a considered taboo in a lot of cultures. We don't like mm-hmm. to share that. If you're going through something, you know, just button up. Don't show your emotions. Don't show that you're crazy. Don't show this and don't do this in front of people because you're going to disrespect me or the family by you know, going off in public emotionally about something, telling people not to cry about it and not to get frustrated about it because it just makes them look bad. And I'm thinking that's not really cool to think it that way because you're literally trying to play the victim card when that person is literally in pain and is you know, there's many ways to say that you need help or that um, I need someone to just talk to me or or whatever the case may be, but they just don't know how to express it. So um, that's just a, it's a taboo. Uh, keep it in a family, so say, you know, everything's hushed behind closed doors that people are able to express. Ironically, I listened to Asian podcasts this morning about Asians have feelings too. And they were talking about the mental health struggles, how they had been told to be a particular way 
if they, you know, decide to get out of the off the line on what their parents have chosen them to be and to do and to act, they are looked with embarrassment. And so it's just like something that finally, as an adult, we are able to say, screw it. This is me. I have to live with me for the rest of my life. Why do I have to listen to someone? I get it. I respect your mom and dad. Thanks. Um, I need to focus on me now, you know, so that's just one of the things that a lot of people are struggling with, especially with the pe- persons of color, specifically, you know, for me, uh, I've dealt with before, and it was always said, well, oh, you'll get over it, or, oh, y- you'll be better tomorrow, don't worry, it's just a phase. Yeah, so I'm glad that you're able to share this and to have a book about it with your personal experience. Speaking of books, what is your three favorite of anything, if quote or an author book sure. of your choice oh three favorite of anything i um, know it's so like <laughs> seriously maybe 300 let's have all day yeah. <laughs> so we'll go with three favorite movies um number one is always inside out as i was saying before for people who don't know that movie it's basically uh about an 11 year old girl named riley and the five uh, basic emotions in her head, uh, sadness, joy, anger, distrust, and fear. And joy and sadness get lost inside Riley's mind. And they are trying to get back to what's called emotional headquarters. And so we see what happens when somebody cannot feel joy or sadness. Number two uh, is the Princess Bride. Uh, for you, those of you who haven't seen The Princess Bride, you have to see it. It's sort of a requirement for being a human exactly. to watch The Princess Bride. <laughs> Give it a chance. I think you'll love it. Uh, it's a, uh, basically a, a fairy tale uh, told uh, by a grandfather to his grandson about, um, to, uh, about a couple who is um, basically... Uh, kept apart and they keep trying to get back together and there are giants and um, Spaniards and six-fingered men and cliffs of insanity and all kinds of wonderful and things. forest forest creatures <laughs> yes forest creatures rats of unusual size yes no rodents rodents, rodents. <laughs> I got that wrong but I corrected it there you go um so I, I have, you know, those are, are pretty much my go-to. And my third one sort of fluctuates. But I'll talk about one that most people don't know, but I think everybody should. It's called Defending Your Life. So Albert Brooks, who was in uh, Finding Nemo and Finding Dory as the dad, okay. um, he uh, wrote, directed, and starred in this movie where he co-starred with Meryl Streep. I and mean, it's about what happens after you die in the movie. What, oh, wow. what, it, what it says, this is, so what happens is that after you die, you go on trial to determine whether you go on to the next plane or you go, you're reincarnated back to earth. And um, it's all about whether you lived your life out of fear or not. Hmm. That's what determines what happens after you go on trial and after you die. Interesting. Well, I'm going to put that on my watch list because I do love Meryl Streep. Oh, and all these movies are Anne and Jasmine approved. So I'm going to give my thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for sure. I definitely got to put that. I said defending your life. All right. I'm yeah. going to go on and stick that on there real quick. Well, thank you. Because now I'm learning something even more like, boy, I'm getting like gushes and gushes of information. I just don't know what to do with myself. My head will be (laughs) spinning after this. What is all in good fun is all in good knowledge. So this is awesome. Who did you think of as a mentor? And what did you need to learn from them? Well, I'm going to go with actually writing the book. Okay. Um, Probably the best mentor that I have is, is my book coach and editor. Amy Collette. So, uh, and I published my book under her imprint, which is Positively Powered uh, Authors. She was just amazing for me. You know, she wrote her own book um, on gratitude. 
Okay. Which I thought was just an amazing book. And, you know, she, she really just helped me um, shape the book and how, you know, I would not have gotten it done in the time period or would have ever gotten it done. I have a lot of trouble with motivation and with depression and anxiety where it's just like, I, I sort of hold myself back. I have trouble a lot of times just Mm -hmm. pushing myself forward. So if it hadn't been for her lovingly pushing me forward and keeping me on a schedule for writing and helping me get through and also reminding me not to get stuck in the weeds when it came to research because I love to research. (laughs) But then, you know, everybody, I think, knows the rabbit hole, not necessarily always of research, but of something where they get a little bit obsessive about it. Yes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You and I both. Oh my goodness gracious. I don't, it's so good to have a cheerleader in your corner. I swear I have the, the same situation. Like I've had so many things where I want to make a book about my life. Oh, and it's going to be one of those really unusual ones. It's going to make you laugh, cry, cringe, uh, run underneath a blanket and hide from all the, the scary things that I will have to say about my life. But it's, I think it's just, um, it'll be just riveting for me and um I just have so much to say about my life but um yeah and I know that you even on your website I believe you had mentioned that you do do that as well where you you help other people with their ideas about books so basically I do um editing and proofreading editing and proofreading okay Mm -hmm. yeah I do that not just for books but also for articles, newsletters, that kind of thing. Nice. Nice. So what accomplishment are you most proud of? Because I know you probably have so many. And don't be modest because I like to gloat with my guests. So let's do this. What what do you have that you (laughs) be proud of? What accomplishment are you most proud of? Oh, I mean, 100% is the book. You know, like I said, it's something I always wanted to do. And I'm just so happy and proud of the fact that I I got to publish it and that gotten a lot of good feedback from it as well. Okay. And I would say other than the book, I think I'm proud of the fact that I'm still standing, that I'm still alive, that I am, you know, doing my best to enjoy life and to connect and all that kind of thing. Going to therapy, you know, taking care of myself. I'm glad you are here with me because I wouldn't get to see, I wouldn't get to see Anne and all the things that you have done. It's amazing that um, I have the honor to, to have you as my guest. And this is like, I'm like glowing with joy because um, I've learned so much. Uh, so I, I want to dig a little bit more into it. I know we're like, not, I'm not pressed for time unless you are pressed for time. You know, talking about way back kind of in the middle of our combo <laughs> that I was doing a little research as well on films. And I'm just I want to read this out because inspiring for me to to dig into this. It's like, OK, I'm going to make my own watch list coming from what Anne told me, because this is mind blowing. So I don't know. I love movies. I just don't know. OK, anyways, back to Everest 2.0. Let me come back. Okay. So scientific <laughs> research has proven that laughter works as medicine. And I didn't even know that laughter can lead to an increase in activity in the immune system, like the T cells, Im- immunoglobin, A and G, gamma uh, interferon, and natural killer cells. And it also decreases stress hormones, which I believe that's why you get into the dramedy, decreases stress hormones which constrict blood vessels and suppress hormone activity, epinephrine and dopamine. That is a tongue twister for me, but for, for you, you're like, oh, I can say that backwards in my sleep. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> about half of those. <laughs> there, there are still some words I'm like, oh God, I hope she doesn't make me try to correct her. Yeah. I don't like... know for sure about that one. <laughs> Sorry, editor. Um, can you edit what I just said? <laughs> I, I can write it down. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, verbal editing. Got you working already. Did you even? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, Jasmine, get a grip. Okay. So um 
And I like you mentioned with your, I know I'm kind of going backtracking, but I just love the idea that you had hit on a subject where different types of movies provide or uh, increase, like I mentioned, the dopamine and epinephrine or or decrease, whichever, in stress and so forth. But with your sister, you said that um, watching a movie together, there's things that I like to share with people to without because I'm I'm such a it's so hard for me to explain my feelings sometimes and I've noticed it if I like watch a movie I'm like oh my gosh this is the movie that I want to show someone that I really want to tell them how I feel but I can't find the words and you want to have them sit with you because it helps you also like you know like if you want to communicate with your partner or friend or colleague and you know you just have the hardest way of trying to communicate with them and finding the perfect kind of movie that's like, that's me wrapped up in a bowl. Check it out on the screen. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there's also this, the kind of like the downside of it is when you're watching a movie and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to share this with somebody. And then you have them, you, ha- you share it with them and you're like, oh my God, that was a really bad mistake because I don't feel the same like, like connection like their their reaction their reaction to the movie when they're with you it's not the reaction that you were anticipating have you ever mm. felt like that before where you're like you're so excited to show somebody this movie like oh my gosh this is going to be so inspiring and so oh emotions you're going to cry with me you're going to laugh with me you're going to air fist the tv you know like go get away from there you know kind of a thing <laughs> um but then you like sit with that person and like it almost feels like this is a confirmation that that person is just not that person to be watching mm-hmm. that kind of movies. And it almost has like a, the air uh, between you becomes like a confirmation where, yep, that's not my living partner for the, you know, this is a temporary partner or this is a temporary friend because they just, they didn't, it didn't click or they didn't feel as the, what you were trying to come across in, in sharing a special movie with them and I don't know I'm, I'm kind of going off on that thing but have you ever felt that way before is it just me I know I've, I've done that and I was trying to while you were talking I was trying to think about what movie was it even I was showing them yeah I know that's happened to me but it's been a long time and I can't remember what movie it was I do remember being on the other side it's interesting because this ex-boyfriend of mine um, had shown me the Millennium Falcon with Humphrey Bogart and I was just like yawn like I just (laughs) did not get into it and he was not happy about that you know he actually named his cat which is my cat now bogey after Humphrey Bogart um I kept the name and I kept the cat (laughs) (laughs) well at least something didn't break from that that moment of movie and you got to keep a furry friend so that's a kind of to me that's a (laughs) win-win Exactly. Exactly. So, so, yeah, that would be that would be me on the other side. Okay. Of that equation. Okay. Because I thought it was just me. Like, is this all in my head, or am I just like thinking about it too hard? Because I'm an overanalyzer. I'm an overthinker. But when you you have those special moments, like even though I just met you, uh, I am talking 200 miles an hour, but I feel comfortable. Uh, but if if I try to express my feelings with somebody, it's really, really hard. I literally have to write it down or I'm just sweating bullets trying to stutter over my words all the time, constantly. And I just look like a dum-dum sometimes when I do that. So, but um, yeah, I thought it was just me. I just wanted to check with you to make sure that I am actually sane when it comes to crazy thinking like that. But yeah. No, <sighs> I mean, but the best of us aren't sane, so. Yeah, well, there that makes me more abnormal, and I'm I'm relieved, so that's good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have been talking about cinema therapy. I would love to know if you have any suggestions that you'd like to share, if you know anything about cinema therapy groups that you'd like to provide to the listeners, if they're interested. Unfortunately, there isn't like a a, a, a directory of that or anything. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, sucks. Yeah, that really does suck. Or at least not that I have, you know, I haven't searched for that for a while now. 
Yeah. Um, I even found out that there's a cinema therapy certificate that people who are interested in being a professional cinema therapist can also apply for. I was like, what? I'm definitely going to share this with Anne. (laughs) (laughs) That's for sure. Like there's stuff online about like how to create a cinema therapy group. Mm-hmm. But if there are cinema therapy groups out there, I would love to hear about them because I am actually looking yeah, at some. But I'm actually I sort of on hold with it, but I've been working on a on getting a cinema therapy um certificate because you can do that as a lay person. Yeah. If you're not yeah. in mental health. When I say a lay person, I mean somebody who's not like a therapist or right. a psychiatrist or mm-hmm. clinician kind of thing. So um, I, I need to get back that. into that um, that certificate because I sort of had put it on to, on the side for a little while. So, yeah. but it's been really interesting so far. The the classes, basically the the reading and testing that mm. that I've gone through so far for the certificate. I believe there are some that are also credited. That's if you are a profession in the professional field of. But yeah, that's interesting. I was just about to ask you if you were doing that because I'll if you didn't know I'll be like. I'm going to tell Anne about this and pop the top on that. Hopefully I was going to give you at least some information. seems like I'm getting all this information from your way, but like, I'm going to trickle just a little bit of knowledge your way (laughs) to make it feel like I actually, uh, I can give you something in exchange, but yeah. I think I just need to create a group. That's all. Yes. That'll be even. Yes. If you do please provide the link if if you want the listeners to be in that that'll be awesome and as well as the other links that um you'd like to have on the show notes that'll be perfect will do Um, is there anything that you'd like to share uh, that i missed in our conversation there was research done um about how watching certain types of movies can actually make you a kinder person or at least temporarily Ooh. kinder person. So um, like altruistic ones, you know, ones where people um, do good things for one another. Um, so one of the movies that was included in that uh, study that is actually in my book is called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Okay. And it's all about how there's this man and his ex-girlfriend erases him from her head through this procedure and so he goes to do the same to her interesting to erase her from his head and it's got jim carrey and kate winslet in it okay now can we put that in a um in a program for people who are in anger management classes (laughs) (laughs) i love that idea or like remember the titans or movies like that so there are certain movies just think of movies where you know somebody does something for somebody else without expecting anything in return Interesting. i would say for instance another movie in the book that i would say is fried green tomatoes like i said all about how people help each other and do things for each other even if it means you know potentially going to prison Mm -hmm. You know, having your freedom taken away to do things for other people because you love them and want to protect them. So I just, you know, I'm really grateful that there's this thing called a movie and that there are movies out there that make me think about the kinds of things that I can do to help other people. Right. I think that's, I think that part of that is that when you watch movies about people helping other people, it can inspire you to want to help other people yes and i think that's that's the connection that's why people are affected by these movies they really are you know they're inspired so that's awesome you know i i know i really do feel i mean obviously my parents well not obviously but my parents did you know have a lot to do with me wanting to you know be as kind as i can be and i'm very lucky that i got that message not everybody does but I think movies also push that for me I I think that's another thing in my life that have really shown me okay like do I want to be like this person do I want to be like Iggy or Ruth in 
uh, fragrant tomatoes and how they interact with other people and interact with the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting perspective. And I'm glad that you're able to catch on to the nourishment and the enriched knowledge and information your parents had shown you. You've been blessed to have that. But yeah, this is, I'm loving this. I'm loving this time with you. And um, thank you so much for this. This is so inspirational. Hopefully for the listeners as well. If it's not just the listeners, it's going to be me, damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're welcome. You know, I really appreciate talking movies with somebody who who definitely is. Oh, yeah. Sounds like, you know, you're just so passionate about movies and about the ones that matter to you. So Mm -hmm. that, that always makes me happy to talk to another person who's passionate about movies. Yeah. I totally agree instead of having those unusual conversations about how's your day like do you really do you really care about what i did for my day or are we going to talk about movies let's just talk about movies <laughs> but you know what we haven't done yet a question i need to ask you uh-huh. is what is your favorite movie or what are your favorite oh, movies? oh gosh put me on the spotlight for goodness gracious okay Ooh. The movie that I always go to, and I don't know why, it almost kind of gives me another glimpse that there is hope in humanity in this broken world, is um, watching Schindler's List. I don't know, for some particular reason, there's spots in there that gives you that glimmer that even though from the hardest tragic turmoil of history there is where was inklings of hope and humanity and love even through this tumultuous times that uh you know the jewish community and the polish community and even people who were considered um it wasn't it there was a large percentage of jewish community involved but there was also people don't know about is that there was a the Polish uh, community was involved, even people who were considered or labeled uh, homosexuals were in this camp as well. Um, yeah. So it hits a lot. <laughs> it's a very emotional. It makes you feel a human that I do have emotions and that I still do care, even though, um, unfortunately, history seems to repeat itself but in a different way depending on what type of community it wants to affect and i just i i just love when there's just that tap of humanity and, and love even f- from the darkest time periods of our lives there is still someone who is there who is there to lend a hand and to help you and i think that kind of you know, you could think of it in different ways. You could think of it as like if you wanted to pick a movie that has such a dark feel to it, because it is it's real life situation that it had it occurred in our history. Um, people compare it to mental health. You know, it's just a thought of being in the lowest of the low of the slow. You feel like there's no um, light at the end of the tunnel. You feel like that. You feel like that in many circumstances of your life and some people unalive themselves because of it because there's just there's no sight to overcoming that so um yeah it just it, it hits on all different levels for me I think I, like I said I'm an over analyzer overthinker but I, I try to see it in different perspectives I see it as a historical uh, monument of one of the worst things that you know, humans can do to humans. And then to see here, we're in the 21st century and it's still happening. Yeah. Um, And I just, I'm wanting to see that hope. It's just peeking its head from all that darkness, but you can see it just fearing over. It's almost there. We're almost there. And I have to deal with that with my emotions, my mental health, my family, being a minority, you know, watching my other brothers and sisters from different communities struggling with this, with the constant, you know, from Asian hate to 
the Black community, the Latino community, even religious communities are going through this. And I just, yeah. want, I just want to have that, like, that moment, like, there's, it's, we're so close, we're so close. Just hold on one more, just hold on one more. So I don't know. I think I just kind of uh, went through <laughs> a journey with you. <laughs> yeah. But that's just how I see it. Um, it means a lot. I guess it makes so much sense to me because I, I, yeah, so enough of that. <laughs> Well, no, like, Schindler's List is probably one of the best movies I've ever seen, for yeah, sure. I think yeah. it's just, it's a fantastic movie. It can be a very hard movie to watch at times, for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. But I can 100% agree with you. The, the love and the kindness and, you know, that end scene where it's like, a, you know, I have this pin and that could have saved X amount of Ten, lives. Yeah, and, exactly. Oh, my gosh. You know, yeah, we won't. I just we got won't. a little bit of chills. Right? <laughs> It's been an honor, and and I wanted to have other listeners know exactly how they are able to reach out to you if they want to get to know what you do, uh, if they are interested in getting into having you as their editor and proofreader, as well as, you know, that book is going to be, like, on the top of my list. So I want the listeners to know exactly how they're able to reach out to you. Sure. Um, so I would say first place I would reach out where I really do, um, interact with people a lot more than anything else is LinkedIn. Um, so just, you, um, search my name, which is Ann, A-N-N-E, Boistel, F-E-U-S-T-E-L. I know it's going to be on all the notes, but maybe somebody's only listening to this thing Mm -hmm. and not watching it. Um, well, I'm not, you know, for whatever reason, you don't see my name. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Um, and, and then um, I am also on Facebook. Uh, my business page is Writing Wisely. And on Instagram, I am Ann Foistel Author. My website, yes, which is wearewritingwisely.com. Dot com and you can get a copy of my signed book through there you can also find my book on amazon nice but outside of that um thank you it's been an honor Anne. it was a blast down this memory uh i guess the memory lane of movies because this is um i feel so nostalgia now i'm just gonna go and prop myself on the couch for the rest of the weekend and just <laughs> <laughs> just binge some old movies because Anne said so. <laughs> there you go. Woo-hoo. I know. So well, exciting. yeah, thank you so much. I, I had a lot of fun too. And I just, yeah, made me happy. So it was, I'm it was glad. an excellent time. I am so glad. Thank you so much. Well, you have a wonderful weekend and I will stay in touch with you. Don't hesitate to contact me um, for any reason. That's what I'm here well, for. I definitely, I definitely will will uh, contact you if I need to or if I want to. So thank you so much. Yeah. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend as well. You as well. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Noise Palooza Zion podcast. And if you enjoy listening to my podcast, please don't hesitate to give me a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify also wanted to give a shout out and thank you so much to all my guests past present and future and stay tuned for the next upcoming episode on fridays